Good evening. I'm Julia Gillen and I'm here to welcome you to Edwardian Picture Postcards, the original social media, part of the Being Human Festival. I'm supported behind the scenes by Olga and Evelyn. Um, if you click on the Q&A icon at the top, you'll be able to uh, place any questions and answer any questions that you have or comments you want to make in the uh, chat window effectively. And Olga or Evelyn will be able to answer for you or um, I'll be talking uh, towards the end, um, answering any questions that have come up in the session. Um, now, before I start, the Being Human Festival asked me to give you some information about the festival. Um, it's, it's the Festival of the Humanities taking place across the UK from the 12th to the 22nd of November. It's the only national festival of the humanities run by the School of Advanced Study, University of London, in partnership with the Arts and Humanities Research Council and the British Academy. Events are mostly online and you can find them at the website uh, beinghumanfestival.org. It's on Twitter, Instagram and Facebook at Being Human Fest with the hashtag Being Human 2020. So please help us keep the fest, keep as many events as possible free and to improve the festival in years to come by filling in our feedback survey. You'll receive it by email from us and we'll show the link at the end. So now here is my first postcard, Edwardian postcard. You can see a young woman making, doing up her hair and her makeup and the message underneath She's written, I'm going to the show at Derby today. It looks rather dull. I hope it clears up. So in this talk, I'm first of all going to introduce my project on Edwardian postcards, answer the question, why are they called Edwardian postcards? And tell you a little bit about the history of the postcard. The main part of my talk will be concerned with comparisons with today's social media. I'll finish with a little bit of information about how you can get involved. And as I said, at the end, we should have some time for questions and answers, and at the very end, an evaluation. So this card was sent to a young girl, Janet Carmichael, who lived in Buxton. I'm so sorry to hear you are poorly. You must be very quick and get better. And as you see, her friend has sent a, a, a card of cute kittens, which were a meme then just as much as now. So the project is the Edwardian Postcard Project. It's at the Literacy Research Centre in the Department of Linguistics and English Language at Lancaster University. We've been working for several years uh, with these postcards from the turn of the century. They're called Edwardian Postcards after the King at the time, King Edward VII, the eldest son of Queen Victoria. Uh, it just so happens that his reign, 1901 to 1910, coincides with the heyday of the picture postcard. Now, this honeymoon card was, fascinatingly, sent to um, a couple who actually were honeymooning at the time. Um, the message teases them to Mrs. Harry Marsden. We suppose you are too spoony, affectionate, to write and let us know how you are getting on. Gives various hints, such as getting some camphory nuts. It's warm weather for a new married couple. So you can see how the humour of the card is made use of by the senders sending it to the honeymoon couple. People received and sent cards wherever they were in those days. It wasn't just something that you did when you were on holiday or at an art gallery. So the card then began in 1869 and very quickly took on in Britain by the post office in Britain. And uh, these cards were extremely dull, as you can see, and you might wonder why they became so popular so extremely quickly. One side, as you see, you could only write the address on, the other side was completely plain and you could write a message. Well, it was the brevity, the smallness of the space that made them popular. Before that, people wrote letters. Letter writing had a lot of etiquette that was taught at school and was relatively complex. And the cards, you just had a short space, and so they were immediately very popular. Then, a very significant innovation, the first part pictorial postcards. So as you can see, the whole of one side still had to be used for the address, but nonetheless, people could fit in quite a bit of writing um, around the cards, especially as you see in the example on the left. The example on the right, dear sister, I have left O, that's Oxford, and I'm now in Reading Station. Love, David. This was David Evans, who was training to be a Methodist minister in Oxford, writing to his sister, Mary Evans, in Camberwell. 
We found out a lot about them because with our collection of cards, we've searched the historical records, particularly the censuses of 1901 and 1911, in order to find out more about the senders and receivers of the cards. Now, I think it's important to say something about the social background at the time and why this was felt at the time to be such a revolutionary age with such change. Essentially, the effects of legislation in the late Victorian age and technological changes were permeating through into the first decade of the 20th century. So we had, for example, growth of the middle classes and increased leisure time, increased cheap and efficient travel. The railway system in the UK was at its zenith in 1909, increased women's rights, very efficient postal services. So you could have several in a town and maybe if you were in London up to 10 deliveries a day, potentially, perhaps from 6 a.m. to uh, up until 10 p.m. at night. The, eventually, um, something like a huge proportion of workers were working for the post office. And that's one reason probably why with the First World War, uh, the postcard became unsustainable in the kind of phenomenal way that it was in the first decade of the century. I think some of the excitement of this change can be seen in some of the cards, such as this one, um, I'm writing this on the sands. A very important part of the background was that we had essentially a completely literate society with the Elementary Education Acts, uh, made schooling available to virtually everybody. Increasing cheapness of paper products, uh, paper had become much cheaper, and so there was a huge opportunity for publishers to make and sell cards. And then there were various uh, colour printing techniques, not colour photography, but various other techniques. The card on the left would have been expensive at the time and still is today. But as you'll see, there were various techniques for adding colour to cards. The Edwardians were very conscious that they were living in a time of great change. This um, cartoon from the periodical Punch in 1910 shows the changes that they felt that they'd experienced with new technologies not always working perfectly over the last 10 years. So in the top card, 1900, we can see the newly invented car, but it's broken down. So it's being pulled by the old familiar horse. Fast forward just 10 years and the horse has been relegated to the field in the background. The road has been made much smoother and yet it's the newfangled aeroplane that has been launched, but again failed. So is being towed by the car. So you can almost imagine just the extraordinary feeling of speedy change that it was to live then. In January 1902, there was an extremely important innovation in the terms of postcard, which is the divided back. So from this time, you could have one side, which is completely a picture, as you see here, these two are kind of celebrating the new technology of the telephone, not accessible to everybody. And on the other side, you just had half of it for the name of the person you're sending it to, the address and the stamp, and then the whole of the other half you've got available to, uh, to write on. So this was a change that led to extraordinary um, further exponential uh, use of postcards. This was called the divided back for obvious reasons. So now I'm going to talk about comparisons with social media. First of all, memes and themes. Secondly, efficiency, popularity, opportunities for creativity, concerns as to whether informality led to vulgarity, and finally, a final comparison, concerns over security and privacy. So I've already mentioned cute cats. Cute cats and dogs were very popular at the time. The top, the left hand card, thanks for the postcard, is sent to Miss Annie Parrish from her sister, another rural farm worker in Lincolnshire. Um, I know a lot about Annie Parrish from her collection of cards. I'll come to her again later. And uh, I've already done one webinar about Miss Parrish's cards, which is available on YouTube. The left hand, the right hand card, sorry, was written to a two year old. So presumably it was written to be read out to her. My darling pet, be a good little girl and mother will fetch you soon. And we've looked in the census and rather sadly, it doesn't seem as if the two were united by 1911 and living together. 
there were crazies in uh, postcards ascending as much as uh, anything else. And for a long time, celebrities and especially actresses were extremely popular. So actresses made a lot of money out of their postcard contracts. Um, on the left, we have Edna May, actually an American actress who became very popular in, Amer in Edwardian musical comedy. She married a millionaire in 1907. Uh, but not long after he died and she made successful comebacks to the stage. On the right, we have Lettice Fairfax, relatively unusual in that she successfully made a transition from the Edwardian stage to silent cinema. The card on the right, though, has rather a, a different sort of message rather than discussing the celebrities. The writer has written, Dear sister, hope you like this one. Many people collected cards, you see. I have been away from school since Wednesday with the tiny worms and goes on to detail uh, her physical woes. So you can see that people collected uh, cards, for example, of their favourite actresses. Now, fashions change and actresses went out of fashion by and large um, and were succeeded by a rather surprisingly different genre. Rough seas. So it became very popular. Um, to uh, send and receive cards of rough seas and the publishers doubtless really enjoyed this. You can see that rather as we have Photoshop today, there was no um, no holding back from uh, adding various unrealistic looking um, techniques to make the sea look much rougher than it was. And rough seas were just a terrifically popular um, thing to collect for quite a time. Of course, many people had their own particular preferences. You know, they might have stuck with actresses, but nonetheless, this uh, this this kind of changes in, in fashion can be seen in our collection. Then, as now, there were selfies. You could buy cameras which actually printed out postcards, but photographers were so um, common, really, in every village and several in a town, that they would often uh, persuade people, as it were, to uh, let them produce cards and then sell them. So the one on the left, for example, is written to Miss Queenie Selhurst. How will this send? suit you. I'll send a dozen or so. So in other words, the photographer is offering her a choice of selfies. And if Miss Queenie likes one, she can buy a dozen or maybe a hundred and carry on sending them. As I've mentioned, the postal service was extremely efficient with several deliveries a day. You might get a card come onto your uh, doorstep at 6 a.m. It could be until as late as 10 p.m. Very often, um, six days a week, perhaps perhaps even one delivery on a Sunday, um, deliveries every day of the year. So because they were so fast, people knew that they could write a message that would arrive within hours. So here's an example. My dear M, I did not get home last night until after 10 o'clock. I had three punctures in back tyre, but mended them myself. Your loving friend, JS. Very sorry, won't be down today, very wet. So you could send a message about what was happening uh, or wouldn't happen that very same day. Here's another one I particularly like. Um, I imagined that the group is a selfie portrait, um, but there's no reference to it, so it's hard to tell. The message to uh, Mrs. Tasker in Doncaster, Dear Mother, just a line to tell you, if George is not coming today, our George will come and fetch the peelings and bring you a bit of pork, so don't get any meat. Hoping you are all well, Mother. Kiss, kiss, kiss to Doris. So I like to think that perhaps Doris was a little girl at home, has perhaps had the card read out to her, and it's perhaps her who's added the scribbles that you can see in the middle of the card. Another reason why this card is interesting is that it does have a few kind of slight misspellings. It's not quite written in standard English, although it's completely comprehensible. One reason why we started the project was to find out about the literacy skills and practices of the Edwardians, of people at the beginning of the 20th century. And by and large, we find writing clear, spelling um, very good, and in general, that they were com very confident writers. So postcards were extremely popular in the era. Um, the postmaster general was actually an extremely important position, a cabinet post, and every year he produced reports about letters, parcels, postcards and so forth, everything that went missing in the post office. Um, and from his reports, we were able to add up the number of cards posted during the Edwardian era, and it was just about six billion, which adds, which makes about 200 per person. And if you think that uh, at any one time, 
a large proportion of the population actually wouldn't be able to send postcards. Perhaps they'd be too young or too old, perhaps have eyesight problems, or perhaps be part of the underclass, um, completely unable to access uh, any postal uh, facilities at all, then it is testament to how tremendously popular they were. This is another card to Miss Parrish, Miss Annie Parrish, who, as I've mentioned, seems to have spent the whole of her life working in farms in uh, fairly remote areas of Lincolnshire. Miss Parrish was in a sense unusual because during the late Victorian era, so many young people, men and women, left the countryside for the towns and the countryside was often described as empty, uh, you know, because there were so few young people there. And looking at the facts of her biography that can be gleaned from the censuses and other records, one might think that she had a very kind of remote um, time, not much in touch with things that were going on. But through her postcard connection, we can see that it was common for her friends and relatives at least to travel occasionally and to exchange postcards of yes, places where they went, but other places as well, where perhaps they weren't going to go, but where they bought, bought cards about because of interest. So for example, one of her cards was for Dublin Law Courts, although it doesn't seem as if any of her friends or family ever went to Dublin. So the postcards were a way in which people could keep in touch with new technologies, with new fashions, with transport uh, changes, such as you can see in this card, and places that they wouldn't otherwise, that they wouldn't be able to go to. We wondered whether cards perhaps might be preferred more by the rich or by the poor, um, or would they be more popular with women or more popular with, with men? And there's lots of evidence from looking in the census um, that the cards were used by rich and poor alike, though obviously not the underclass that's been documented by uh, people such as Jack London and so forth. So the card, uh, uh, sorry, the illustration on the left is not actually a postcard. It's an illustration in, from a periodical, but I find it kind of really fascinating the way that it shows these women in a park um, you can see on the right, they're choosing cards from the selection that the postal worker has there. The woman on the bottom left is actually writing the card and then they're posting them there and then. And so the, card, the postcards are meant to look like the height of fashion. We have one card to Lloyd George's daughter. He was um, a pr one of the prime, a prime minister um, in the early 20th century. So this again indicates that cards were used by a variety of people and occasionally the collecting habits of the royal family were discussed. On the other hand, we have cards who went to some of the poorest workers in society. The card on the right, Manchester Cathedral, was sent to the 17 year old daughter of a tin miner. And it's made clear that she did collect cards as the sender has said, hope you like this for your collection. Uh, it was actually sent to Evelyn Friggins, the daughter of a tin miner living in, I hope you'll forgive my pronunciation, a hamlet called something like Bojiwian in Cornwall. Um, sadly, we know that Evelyn died um, two years later after receiving this card. Uh, mortality was very high in the hamlet among the tin miners and their families. There were various ways in which the cards make opportunities for creativity, perhaps in quite a minor way, as in this card, where you might not call it creativity, but uh, I think it's uh, it's clear that the sender has made some effort in, for example, slanting the writing, um, using really quite attractive handwriting, and then the extra kind of touch of two stamps. This is completely unnecessary. It doesn't get there any quicker, but the two stamps placed at a jaunty angle probably were part of a code. You know, you could buy code books to tell you about how to slightly alter the stamps, or of course, you could just create a, a code between yourselves. So perhaps Spen, who sent this, was quite fond of Squibbs, Miss Muriel Norris. We don't know anything though about her. We couldn't find her in the census. Ways in which creativity is perhaps a little more evident is in narrations on the cards or the way that people use the multimodal possibilities. So this card, the picture side, the men are very domesticated, was presumably a card that a publisher produced 
and then sold versions of in different places. So you can see that at Brighton has in a sense been added um, by the by the printer, by the uh, postcard publisher and printer in order to make this card particularly saleable in Brighton. Somebody has been amused by it, has bought it and has put, as you can see, example Arthur. Now one interesting comparison I like to make with social media is the fact that when I write on Twitter, for example, you'd have to go to a lot of effort to uh, put your writing in different uh, different orientations or to um, use handwriting. I'm not saying nothing's completely impossible, but it's rather hard. And you can see how this person has gone in different directions in their writing on the card and we'll soon see um, why and how they've done this. It's been sent to a Miss Cook who, although 16 years old, was already working um, as a typist, a modern profession, and she was the daughter of a car fitter in Coventry. So her father, again, belonged to then a very modern, a very new um, trade. So what has the sender written? So we've transcribed it to Miss Cook in Coventry. Dear Ethel, you mean bound and not to write. Very sad occurrence in Brighton Saturday. You'll be grieved to hear it. I stood on one groin, that's a breakwater, and my hat, four and a half pence one, blew off into the sea. I don't believe I shall ever see it again. So we've got a nice little tale there. And we've also got something that the writers are often doing, which is demanding more writing in return. Um, here, here this sender is uh, criticising the person for not writing. Then written above that text, they put Arthur arose at 6am this morning. Very energetic, isn't he? You remember that they've already made the joke about the picture of the domesticated man um, on the picture side. And then added finally, written across the top of the card, mother arrived safely, we all met her. So perhaps the senders remembered to uh, include some presumably vital information. So many of the cards have kind of little stories like that. And if we can find the person in the census, we can find even more context. But even without that, there are some sh short stories, rather as you get in social media. Another way in which you could be creative, I've already suggested you could commission a card, for example, a selfie or perhaps a photo of your family in front of your house. Or, of course, you could um, absolutely make your own illustration from scratch, use a plain card. So this person has put posting the postcards and they've done rather a lovely um, illustration, I think, um, particularly if you think the, the finesse of working at this size. And the girl in green, you might actually just be able to see that she's got Gertie on her hem. And she, the Gertie is actually the sender and the boy on the left is Willie, who she writes about as well. So let me see, just find that. So. Uh, the card's being sent to Miss Nichols in Sydenham, Kent, and she says, what do you think of my painting? I shall make a good, I will try and write a next time Gertie artist. Doesn't completely kind of make sense. I think she's put all the effort into the into the painting. Anyway, she's Gertie is the centre of the card and she talks about being away with Willie on the back of the card. I hear nothing else, but how is Willie? So just another way of kind of being creative and creating your your own image rather than go for the publishers as even though the publishers produced a huge variety of different kind of genres so another concern that the uh, the edwardians had that was sometimes reflected in the media and could be to us indeed today was did informality lead to vulgarity um you know we might at the time, some of the humour was seen as questionable and looking at it with different eyes, we could find some of this questionable today. For example, the image on the top right. Interestingly, when I read the messages, they both these cards were sent as apologies, as really quite um, articulate and elaborate apologies. So it seems in the context of trying to send a humorous card while, as it were, to make up for having done something wrong. So the um, the under the red robe card was sent to Miss Sherburn, just 16 years old, um, and the writer goes into a very elaborate apology, including, I am awfully sorry I gave you all the trouble this afternoon. I waited under boots for half an hour and then I strolled about a bit, hoping to meet you and come home. Then they decide to kind of make some reference to the shared joke, as it were. How do you like this master? What face is that beneath your pew, pew skirt? And then they go back into the apologising mode Please excuse scrawl, I can't find a good nib. So we can at least see some of the motive of the person that sent it. 
even if it would seem very inappropriate today. The bottom card, reckless youth makes rueful age. This is again an elaborate apology, although this time the person sending it doesn't make any reference image at all. The message is, dear James, very sorry to disappoint you, as I have had to work very late tonight, but I will be up there as early as I can tomorrow night. Cannot stop for more. Just got time to catch the 9.30 post. Love from, I think it says Walter. So again, a, a card that kind of shows a lot about the efficiency and speed of the cards. Um, that, that, that it could arrive kind of in the late evening. Here are two more cards that perhaps with eyes today we might see as somewhat questionable. The card on the left about fresh, fresh butter seems to be a joke stereotyping Irish people. The card makes no reference to the joke or to that, but it just concerns elaborate arrangements to meet up. On the other hand, the card on the right appears to have been bought just for the purpose of sharing the joke, as the writer um, sends sends it to a boy um, from his cousin and kind of goes on about the, the nail and the plank and the trousers, evidently finding it rather funny. In the media, there were different opinions about postcards. Um, quite early on, much of the media was quick to kind of see the advantages of them and uh, recognise that they were part of popular culture and there were many articles written about them. But there was also, as with, um, well, say, for example, the beginnings of text messaging, um, a concern that perhaps allowing especially young people to just write briefly instead of write long letters might lead to a decline in literacy and to um, a decline in standards of style. So, for example, George Sims um, wrote postcards utterly destructive of style. Um, James Douglas uh, did not agree with this himself. Um, but he wrote about, he was a journalist who wrote about postcards. So he was quoting people and here quoting one person saying, the picture postcard carries rudeness to the fullest extremity. There was a concern that, uh, as I say, that people's standards of written English would decline because they were just writing short cards. There was a sense that uh, maybe that card images would get more and more vulgar, a concern about that. And occasionally indeed reports um, in the uh, newspaper about pornographic postcards, uh, usually associated, not necessarily with any evidence, with France. So there were also concerns of over security and privacy. Uh, one person, obviously, who would see your cards because of all these visits would be the postman. So, and they were always postmen, not women, um, out doing the deliveries um, in those days. So it does seem that some people made mild attempts perhaps to thwart the postman um, from reading it. So for example, the card at the bottom um, to Miss Evans, you might remember uh, her brother appeared at the beginning, but this is a different one, is in mirror writing. And people quite often use mirror writing so that you would just hold it up to the mirror in order to read it. Um, the card on the top left is in a different sort of code. We see lots over shorthand, um, examples of shorthand and uh, uh, anyway, various ways of kind of concealing the writing or at least making it a bit more difficult to, to read. Uh, another way in which cards were um, parallel, I suppose, to today's social media is that unlike a letter, if you sent somebody an insult in a postcard, you could be sued for libel. If you insulted somebody in a letter, that, that wasn't the case because it was private, because it was in an envelope. But again, there were many newspaper stories about people being sued. Uh, one such woman in, in West London, I remember, uh, wrote an insulting uh, letter to a dog's home owner that she'd given her dog to, but she alleged that um, the, dog, the dog home owner had just let the dog die. And because she was felt to be because she was found to be so insulting in this postcard, then she was actually taken to court and got into a lot of trouble over it. And she wouldn't have gone to court if she had written the allegations in a letter. So overall, then the Edwardians were constant postcard communicators. Uh, some of the genres, such as the one on the left, kind of give a give a. Um, uh, you know, kind of evidence this kind of in the picture with such jokes. Um, you'll get a good toweling from me if you don't send me a line. So a kind of humorous way of just asking for a message back. Uh, many of the card writers asked for letters. 
and some of them s say that they're sending a card just as a kind of brief one and they'll send a letter later. That's also very common. So there's a sense in which postcards are partly taking the place of letters. Um, you can't write at length, you can't write privately, but on the other hand, the image means that you're sending a kind of gift at the same time as you're writing something. So the Glasgow Evening News in October 1903 wrote, in 10 years, Europe will be buried beneath picture postcards. This was relatively early in the craze, but they could see that it was a big thing. And Miss Janet Carmichael of Buxton, who I've mentioned before, this was one card in her collection. She was visiting her father's relatives in Lockerbie in Scotland and received this one day. It just has her name and address on the other side. This side, it says, hope to see you this evening, love Nessie. So I think in a way that's an encapsulation of how um, kind of popular, efficient um, and so forth they were. Um, when people talk about Edwardian postcards, uh, we, we often can't uh, resist sharing this quote because it is such a magnificent one. And it's James Douglas kind of summing up uh, why they were useful at the time and what they mean to us now. So he wrote, when the archaeologists of the 30th century begin to excavate the ruins of London, they will fasten upon the picture postcards as the best guide to the spirit of the Edwardian era. Like all great inventions, the picture postcard has wrought a silent revolution in our habits. It has secretly delivered us from the toil of letter writing. So you can see again there the point that I made at the beginning, that the postcard was popular partly just because you couldn't write a vast amount on it. So then, um, you can, if you're interested in this talk, and I hope you are, there are various ways in which you might choose to get involved. Um, we have an interactive website. Uh, which actually, I'll start with the, the simplest use. You could use it, for example, to search for cards in our collection. You can search by surname. You could look up your name, for example. You could look up a town. So you could perhaps use your postcards if you're on a family history project. There's just a chance that you might find something relevant there. Or perhaps particularly if you're doing a local history project, you might uh, find some cards that might give you more information either in the pictures or in the writing about these cards. By the way, this one um, is yet another example of um, how people could make their writing harder to read. This is Crosshatch, which became popular in the Victorian era, and it's, writ it's uh, written by a man to his wife and tells the tale of how walking along um, he bumped into his eldest son one day. And it's quite clear from this sort of very um, fluent way that they do it, that they were very, uh, they found quite easy to uh, write and read in this style, although it took us a while to puzzle it out. So then you could use the website as a resource for yourself and your own interests, um, or you could join us to help our research. You could, for example, transcribe cards, um, or perhaps you've got your own cards and though you want to keep them, you might be kind enough to perhaps upload scans of the cards to contribute to our research. You need either a Facebook account or um, you can log on with Google. So we also have um, social media, various channels. We have a Facebook page. We have a Twitter account. I have a YouTube playlist with a few um, webinars or short recordings or slightly longer ones like this. Um, and if there's anything you think of later that you would like to ask me, then feel free to contact me by email j.gillan at lancaster.ac.uk. So now um, we, we've got some time then um, before we move to ask you to complete the evaluation to um, ask if there are any quest any questions that perhaps I can answer or perhaps I can't. Mm -hmm. um, so have you found the talk as lively as the scene of Hastings um, Hastings Coast? Or I think the card on the right wins my prize for perhaps one of the most boring pictures I've seen, but perhaps somebody out there might find something interesting in it. So Evelyn um, or Olga, uh, do you, yes. were there any questions that you could yes. uh, tell me about? <laughs> yeah. Yes, of course. Um, there are actually many questions for you, Julia. Um, oh, good. I'm going to read some of them. Yeah, and starting with Pam, who's asking if there um, is a national archive for postcards or collection in various organi organizations like museums or private collections. 
There are many private collections and some museums do hold collections. So do some libraries. Um, I used to find a, a slightly sort of um, unfortunate attitude in that, that I, I've sometimes asked in places and be told, oh no, they're ephemera. At the same time, though, I'm not aware of a collection quite like mine, um, which is online and which includes the written side. Again, um, many museums and libraries are only interested in the picture side of the cards. I've seen, for example, even at Lancaster University, a small collection in which the cards have been glued onto paper or into books so that you can't see the written side. So I do think uh, my project is relatively unusual in being equally, well, very much concerned with the writing. Um, thank you, Julia. I'm moving to the next question. Um, I'm reading it. I see the postman collecting the cards from the women. Uh, did they collect from houses or only deliver? They only delivered to houses. Um, I think the event in the park must have been quite unusual. Um, you know, I, I don't think that would be uh, common for it to work quite like that. On the other hand, we know that you could post cards in all sorts of places. There were, for example, post boxes in stations or even on trains. Um, you know, so if you were sitting on a train, you might write a card and then move along to the next carriage and put it in a box. Um, there were so many in, in street corners and so forth. And I do think that in rural areas, I think the postman who delivered must have picked up as well. I can't see how otherwise it would have worked. Mm -hmm. um, and now a question from Michelle. Um, is there anything like copyright or intellectual property rights uh, that protects the content of the postcards? Uh, these predate 1911, so these writers and recipients uh, census data in the public domain. But if there was sensitive material, does permission from the ha fa family have to be sought before sharing? No. Um, I'm quite confident in that because I know that so many publications, uh, there have been hundreds of books actually, which have simply um, shown the cards of over 100 years old. Um, but it's a very interesting question, nevertheless. Um, I've actually found, in, found one card um, that by looking in the census, I eventually worked out that the, uh, a woman mentioned had fallen victim, as it were, to a bigamist. And uh, I thought, you know, well, I wonder if, you know, if the family were to find out of his, you know, second wife who didn't know about his first wife, as I surmise, um, uh, then, uh, you know, could that be upsetting? You know, it might be that somebody could actually work out that it was their grandfather or great grandfather. Um, but that's very, very unusual. I think in general, it's so long ago. And certainly there is a great deal of precedent of, um, of cards being published and messages uh, if they're over 100 years old. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Julia. Uh, moving to the next question. Hi, Julia, and thank you for this fascinating talk. I have two questions regarding this topic. The first one is that how did you retrieve all these postcards? And the other one is, um, do you think there is a connection between sending postcards in the Edwardian times and sending birthday holiday cards now in the British culture? I find it very mm. interesting that in the UK, people are very enthusiastic about sending cards for special occasions, while in Chinese culture, this practice is actually uncommon. Right. Oh, well, two fascinating questions there. Yes, it's taken many years to uh, acquire the cards. Um, we, I mean, we used to, you know, buy them all. I typically buy them in junk shops, um, in antique fairs or at postcard fairs. Um, until the pandemic, there was quite a thriving trade of, of specific postcard fairs, and I would go along to them um, and buy the cheaper cards um, because there were many, many postcard collectors, but 99% of them collect along a certain historical photographic theme. So it might be an area, it might be cruise ships, um, it might be something like perhaps sports people. Um, it could be actresses or whatever. So most postcard collectors who go along to postcard fairs are interested in a particular kind of genre of the card. 
Um, then there's a tiny, tiny proportion of people who believe it's not are interested in postmarks. And then I found myself one of the few people going along to these stalls and saying, can I look through your cheapest cards? And uh, what I'd be looking for is a card that's been gone through the post between 1901 and 1910, um, which has a legible and kind of readable um, address C and an address on it so that I might stand a chance of being able to find, you know, at least that person in the census. So, yes, they've taken a long time to um, to collect. I've been donated many, um, particularly by um, Nigel Hall, with whom I use of Manchester Metropolitan University um, and other, and other uh, generous people. And also, as I say, more recently, um, I've been uh, people have been kind enough to share scans with me so that they've been able to actually keep hold of the cards. The second question about about celebration. Yes, absolutely. Uh, many of these cards, I don't think I showed you any this time, but many of the cards are actually also, as it were, or instead Christmas cards or New Year cards. Um, lots of postcards were sent for that reason. One card, for example, um, is of a, a, a parish priest um, who has uh, commissioned, as it were, lots of what had called selfies of him sitting there writing, and he sent them to all his parishioners um, as a Christmas card. It's kind of, you know, written on Happy Christmas. He's posted them all on Christmas Eve, and I do kind of wonder what they what they felt about it. But yes, so it is very much um, continuing part of British culture. I think postcards have changed um, function um, and are undoubtedly far less popular now. But you're completely right, the questioner, in um, mentioning the British fondness for uh, for cards celebrating birthdays and various other occasions. And I'm noticing, you know, even during the, the pandemic that the card shops or online ways of sending cards are still popular. So thank you very much for both of those insightful questions. Thank you, Julia. Uh, and the next question, can you say a bit more about the real photo postcards in your data set? I imagine that these gave people even greater opportunities to perform identity in the same way as social media um, because they had more control over the types of images they sent to others. Yes, um, you're quite right that there are very diff there are various different kind of techniques and methods and the real photographs and the kind of drawings or the cards which have um, which are various kinds of mixtures. Um, you remember on the rough seas, you might the the publisher might have started with some kind of photograph and then literally added on colour and so forth. I think this card on the left here that we're looking at of Hastings will have hand colouring in. Sorry, I've taken myself away from the question. Yes, yeah, about performing identity. Very much so. Very much so. The cards that you sent could say a lot about you. So, for example, um, I've mentioned Janet Carmichael, the one who received the card in Lockerbie, and she lived mostly in Buxton, um, but she was visiting Lockerbie. One of her friends, um, from whom we have several cards, I can't for the moment remember her name, but anyway, she's she she lives in. Um, Bath. So it seems quite natural that when when she's in Bath, this friend, she sends cards of Bath. But interestingly enough, she travelled too. But whenever she travelled, it seems, she still carried on sending cards of Bath. So most people, I mean, would kind of vary. But it seems to be part of her identity to send cards of Bath. So she must have taken them with her wherever she travelled and sent them. So it must, so being from Bath and sharing cards of Bath was very much part of her identity. On the other hand, as I've suggested, you know, somebody else might be very fond of, for example, um, you know, sending actress cards or or kind of using cards about places to initiate discussions about them. So, yes, I do see very much, just as with social media, the, the choice of card you sent as being part of a performance of identity. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Julia. Uh, and the next question. Uh, just a side note, I wonder if the, the men are very domesticated at Brighton Card is subtly hinting at the uh, suffrage movement. I know the green and purple colours of the women's social and political uh, union on the walls and the women sitting and the man cleaning, which was one of the fears of the anti-suffrage movement. 
Well, that's fascinating. I've never thought of that card in that light. And I will go back and look at this and think more carefully. I mean, in general, I haven't got suffragette cards, partly because they're collected by collectors. And so they're kind of out of my price range. But I hadn't thought to perhaps try interpreting that particular card in that light. So thank you for that suggestion. I will have a look and think about that. Thank you, Julia. Uh, were sets of postcards produced for collections as with cigarette cards? Yes, yes, absolutely. In fact, um, the, the I've, uh, I'm currently writing a book about the cards, and one of the things that's really interested me is the competition amongst publishers. And if a publisher could produce a particularly popular set and get people to sort of want them all or to start collecting them you know they'd really kind of hit the jackpot so absolutely they you could you could buy a set of all sorts of um in all sorts of genres like as indeed is the case of cigarette cards so you there might be a set for example of 10 famous cricketers or um i don't know 10 different views of hastings or you know whatever is the case so indeed they were often sold in sets um and Publishers really wanted people to get keen on on buying them in that in that way. Thanks, Julia. Um, and are there any connections between these and uh, stereoscopic imagery? Was there a cross pollination? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I'm sorry. Yes, I don't know. I've got some inkling of. of um, I think perhaps you're you're more knowledgeable um, the questioner um, than with me. I do, I don't know. Thank you. And the next question. Very interesting. Thank you. How global were these trends uh, Europe wide or throughout the world? I have some from France in this era. Yes, yes, I have a few from Europe. Um, it, I kind of felt found, have found it quite tempting when visiting other places to uh, kind of pop into antique shops or look in markets or whatever. Um, I don't know that I have the knowledge to say that they were worldwide. Certainly pretty big across Europe, I can certainly say that. I mean, uh, Finland, for example, was a place where they were there was quite a craze. Indeed, uh, France, uh, Germany, um, the at the beginning of the decade, the best cards were said to come from Germany and uh, they were slightly ahead in kind of the reproduction techniques. So German cards were were felt to be superior and England did a bit of a catch up job. Indeed, some of British publishers actually got their cards printed in Germany. Um, but across the world, um, I know there's a project at um, the School of Oriental and African Studies, um, which has looked at cards from India um but i don't know i i can't really um say much more than that oh i do know ever such a lot in uh, new zealand and uh australia indeed very popular there thank you julia and uh, the next question from nick how peculiar to the uk was the popularity in postcards did other countries experience a similar boom in their use around this time Yes, yes, in short, I think many countries did, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Thanks, um, and um, the next question. Hi, Julia, uh, do you have a favourite postcard you've come across and uh, what did, you, did it contain? Well, I actually like that Brighton one. I, I, I guess I was born in Brighton and I like the, I just like the combination of the little story and the the mention of the um, Arthur on the image and I have, I've got yet more to think about with the person who suggested a possible suffragette kind of connection. So uh, yes, that's that's actually my favourite card that I've shared with you. And uh, another question from Michelle. Uh, the reason I ask is that I have a collection of postcards sent from young women who attended a mother and baby home where they gave their babies up for adoption. Wow. Wow, that is an impressive collection. Mm. That's um, very impressive. Yes, I've heard of some unusual, unusual topics, but yes, that 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 is an unusual focus for a collection. Mm, and there is one last question, Julia. Um, how are uh, I've lost it? <laughs> Sorry, just a second. Uh, how are the bulk of the cards you have written, pencil or pen and ink? Fascinating talk. Thank you. 
Oh, thank you very much. Yes, indeed. Um, we have categorised them in all sorts of ways, um, including write, writing implements. So I think I haven't got the figures to hand right now, but um, I think pencil is the most popular. Um, there are quite a lot in ink and there are many in indelible pencil, which now kind of looks roughly sort of purplish. But I think an indelible pencil gave a little bit more protection against the rain. So that must have been quite popular at the time. But indeed, we, we started off the project uh, being interested in, in writing implements and what people were using. So, so thank you for giving me the opportunity to say that. So I've um, very much enjoyed um, enjoyed those excellent questions. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much for attending. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, we'd be very grateful if you take part in the evaluation of this event. Um, I've put a link up here, but it will also be included in an email you get via Eventbrite. Uh, being this is the the evaluation is not conducted by me. It's by Being Human, the festival. Um, and they've said that you might win a £100 voucher by entering the prize draw. All answers will be kept anonymous. So I'd like to thank you very much um, on behalf of Evelyn, Olga, to whom many thanks. And I'm Julia Gillen. So I think we can end it. We can end this now. So many thanks. Many thanks, Evelyn and Olga. Thank and many you. thanks, most of all, to all of you who've attended. Thank you. Good night.